Uh, so welcome to, to the uh, roundtable dedicated to the impact of the war in Ukraine on academic freedom. Uh, my name is Daniela Herrera from University of Catania in Italy, and I chair uh, the ACPR Working Group on Academic Freedom. Um, this is a new uh, working group which has been established by the CPR uh, last October, uh, and it was established to uh, raise awareness on the very sensitive topic of academic freedom. Uh, we know very well that this is a, a very sensitive and contested and controversial topic, but uh, we uh, as scholars uh, based in Europe, but also scholars who are based in non-European countries are uh, suffering in many cases the effects of academic freedom and we all need to reflect uh, on the challenges uh, that we are all uh, facing. So this working group has been created with the aim of uh, promoting a reflection um, and um, also to promote initiatives uh, and to raise more concerns and more awareness among the community which is represented within, uh, within the ACPR. Um, so this is the first um, public event that we are organizing. Uh, and so in this spirit, we have decided to um, combine uh, the important topic of academic freedom on the, together with um, one of the most important uh, contemporary events that the global political system is, uh, is living, which is the war in Ukraine. So obviously, we know very well that as it is also starting to dis be discussed during this, uh, this conference, the war in Ukraine uh, is, has already turned into a hegemonic war and it's expected to uh, change uh, relations among states and alliances, future states alliances. But at the same time, it is already um, has already changed changed the life of hundreds of scholars in Ukraine. Uh, and is also producing an impact on debates uh, all over the world and particularly in Europe. Uh, so we have combined the, 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 the problem of uh, a discussion on academic freedom that we know very well that this is, there are growing concerns in several European countries among scholars together with uh, the impact of the war in Ukraine. And so in this spirit, we have decided to open uh, this event to a wider audience, so to be included into the ACPR out series. So it is also open online to um, not only to participants to this conference, but to any, everyone who is interested in uh, knowing more uh, about this topic. Uh, so thank you for those who has also registered and have joined online. Um, so we have a panel of uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, and I'm now going to introduce themselves. There are, um, introducing them, there are uh, uh, wide competencies in this in this specific field, but uh, I'm not going to um, to list everything they have done. I'm just going to to talk about to to mention their affiliations. If if you will see more about their uh, uh, eminent uh, CV in the web page on on the event. So we have Nonna Mayer. Uh, who is CNRS Research Director Emerita at the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics Social Support. She is online. Uh, thank you, Nonna, for being with us today. Uh, and then we have Claudia Padovani, Associate Professor in Political Science and International Relations at the University of Padua in Italy. And she's one of the three coordinators of the um, Scholars at Risk Italy uh, National Section. Uh, she's here. Thank you, Claudia, for being with, with us today here. Uh, we have Irina Maximenko, Associate Professor and PhD in Political Science and the Department of International Relations, Political Science and Sociology at the Odessa Mekignov National University. Thank you for being with us. And so the, the last uh, speaker is Olga Tokariuk. Uh, she's an independent journalist and non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis based in Ukraine. And she's online from Kiev, I presume. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, for Hello. being with us. Thank you. Uh, so I'm very grateful to all our distinguished speakers for accepting our invitation and sharing their views with us. I will immediately uh, start the discussion um, I would like to uh, 
practice uh, with the uh, very difficult uh, notion of definition, provided that we real need, we really need a definition. Um, we know very well that uh, academic freedom is a global concern in all regions, all fields, and is a concern for a scholar space in European countries and uh, in democratic countries, obviously, but also for scholars based in the authoritarian regimes. However, we know very well that it's hard to find uh, definitions or universally uh, accepted definitions. So I would like to ask uh, our speakers to start sharing with us, according to their experience and their views, um, how they can uh, define academic freedom and which approach, uh, according to their views, can be more efficient uh, for discussion, for discussing and promoting. Uh. Thank you for inviting me and I come here with trying to learn a lot from Olga and Irina because that's really the heart of the, the topic. It's, it's uh, difficult to define. It has very long history. Uh, it goes back to the Middle Age, the fight of European universities for independence against the church and the king and closer to the Humboldt model of university. That's where I find the, the clearest definition. It's the one that has been taken up by UNESCO, for instance, in its statements of 1997. One finds a lot in there which can still be used today. Uh, the right without constriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom of teaching and discussion, freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing the results, freedom to express freely their opinion about the institution, etc. Most of the things and the autonomy of university and academic is there. But in a time of crisis as today, it takes, I think, a different meaning. And it, I was very interested by the new Global Observatory on Academic Freedom, which is really calling for redefinition something more universal. So what I can say, I'm not a specialist of uh, academic freedom. I'm a researcher. I face these problems. So I would like to speak from a situated point of view, researcher in political science. I've chaired the French Political Science Association for some times, and that gives me uh, ideas, affiliated to the public service of research, which is the CNRS in France. And I've personally experienced many attacks with my colleagues in the last year as an Islamo leftist. So the first thing I'd like to say is that it's something specific freedom, academic freedom. It's not just freedom of opinion. It's the very condition for the advancements of scientific knowledge, justified knowledge in perpetual search for truth and the result of which is a common good, a universal common good. So I think it's not as simple as all that to define academic freedom. Now, I would say in a way, uh, academic freedom, it's at the same time to be free to do things and to be free from a certain number of constraints. To be free to, it's to choose our research topics, including very sensitive ones as racism, immigration, Islam. Uh, define the way we tackle them, the concept and theories, including Islamophobia, gender, intersectionality, which are under attack severely in France today define our methods and empiric, empirical approach uh, in spite of the more and more bureaucratic norms of ethic committees and IRBs. That's also part of the academic freedom. And of course, the right to publish, teach, present our results inside, outside the university. I would say it's also unlimited access to the global market of ideas, research, must be international. Exchange and dialogue over countries and disciplines are vital. Now, it should be conversely free from religious, political, economic interference. And that means material security. That's essential. To be independent, one needs tenure, public funding, position, grants and fellowships, decent salaries, these are the conditions of independence. And all over Europe, and especially in France, the trend is to a dramatic drop of research and teaching positions. So that's one of the conditions. The other one, of course, is institutional autonomy, and that means self-governance. And that means something which I could call academic democracy. And that means that academy should be inclusive, fighting against the different forms of discrimination and harassment, allow for representation not only of scholars 
but also students and also un academic staff, which is very important. Participation of the three communities in decision and also democratic deliberation. That means exchange of rational arguments on an equal footing and in civil tones, which is not the case today. And that means, and I'll finish on that, that uh, academic freedom for me has its counterparts. It means that we must respect and define together the basic scientific and ethic rules. Scientific, that means critical thinking, distance from our object, systematic, rigorous analysis of the data. It means intellectual integrity, respect of the others, those with whom we work and those we work on. And it's important, uh, we've tried at the French Political Science Association to make a chart of ethics, and that really needs something. It's at the same time the, the rights and the duties, and we should discuss them together and not let it be imposed by the outside. The last thing, it should be an open academy, open to the members of the scientific community, open science, but also more open to the public with the different forms of participative and uh, collaborative research. And that would be a beginning. And I'll stop there to leave time. Thank you very much, Nonna. And so you immediately start with the discussion with very important uh, aspects of the topics, particularly, you know, that, that, that everyone has the right to be uh, to, to live in an inclusive academic uh, environment and also the responsibility to be inclusive, as much inclusive and, and open as possible. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Claudia. Thank you, Daniela. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Nonna, for introducing so many um, relevant uh, elements and dimensions uh, uh, that can contribute to our understanding of academic freedom. As it was um, anticipated, I'm here uh, speaking as one of the coordinators of the Italian section of Scholars at Risk, and therefore uh, what I'm presenting and the, the comments I'm sharing, they come from that experience. Uh, so on the one side, of course, we're all aware of what has happened with the most recent crisis uh, in Afghanistan, uh, basically a year ago, and then Ukraine. But of course, uh, uh, the, the call for strengthening the commitment of our universities and our higher institution uh, dates uh, uh, back uh, much longer. Nevertheless, over the past few years, there have been uh, a very high attention by a number of European institutions uh, on the points of academic freedom. And therefore, I would like to, to um, refer, uh, mention and comment on some of these documents, because I think they not only state uh, the, the, the state the status of academic freedom, but they also indicate somehow the way uh, in which we can conceptualize better, understand some of the changes, think of academic freedom also in terms of the codification and how do we find that in norms. Uh, and they also point to the practices. And so um, the, the Global Observatory for Academic Freedom was just mentioned. There is a very recent report, it's a 2022, which basically focuses on how our understanding of academic freedom is changing. And it suggests precisely this, that we should be looking at academic freedom, both as a principle, of course, uh, as something that is being codified uh, in norms and frameworks, uh, and also something that really pertains to our practice. So Scholars at Risk uh, uh, builds uh, and, and bases uh, its activity precisely on the definition that comes from the UNESCO that has just been mentioned, where a number of different elements are uh, uh, presented, so I won't go into that. I think in our experience, uh, uh, some of the elements that we would like to highlight is uh, how is it that we understand uh, at-risk uh, scholars? Uh, and that includes professors, teachers, doctoral students, institutional leaders, and other members of uh, higher education communities. So this has already been highlighted by Nona as well. Uh, we would also like to highlight the fact that this is not just about individuals. It's not just about single professor, teachers, and, and researchers, but it really affects and involves uh, the entire academic community. And so we should consider the collective dimension 
of academic freedom, uh, even when it comes to you know, having an impact to society at large. And then finally, uh, we stress the fact uh, that academic freedom should always be considered in relation to a number of other core values uh, for higher education, which include, uh, and some of this has been mentioned already, institutional autonomy, accountability, equitable access uh, and social responsibility. So the reason why I think it's important to mention some of these uh, recent uh, European documents, it's because uh, uh, most of this has been triggered by recent cases that have affected European institutions, uh, particularly uh, we could mention the Central European University that was recently, I mean, forced uh, to move to Vienna after 2015. And at that time, uh, the provost of the Central European University uh, considered that a moment of crisis uh, of academic freedom. I think we are still sitting in that moment and we're still faced by that moment. So in 2018, uh, the European Parliament adopted a report uh, on the defense of academic freedom in the EU's external action. Some of the things that are highlighted in there is the fact that academic freedom should be considered as part of the human rights machinery, particularly in relation to the right to education and the right to freedom of expression. And also uh, the, the same report stressed how academic freedom and violations affect uh, society at large. In 2020, the Bonn Declaration for uh, Freedom of Scientific Research that was adopted by the European Research Area stressed the aspect of academic freedom being a public good, as was just mentioned, and also a pillar of any democracy. Also in 2020, uh, the ministers of the European Higher Education Area adopted a Rome Ministerial Communique uh, where it is said uh, that uh, academic freedom is not only about individual scholarship, scholarship and expression, but it's also about institutional autonomy. We find reference to academic freedom in the European strategy for universities that was adopted in 2022. And uh, it is stated there that it is at the core of all higher education policies. So all these documents and a few more, I mean, the, the, the latest one is uh, the Marseille Declaration that was adopted uh, this March, uh, uh, by the International Cooperation in Research and Innovation meeting that was hosted in France. Uh, it also stresses all these common values uh, and principles. And I think it's important because uh, there is uh, an ongoing reference uh, uh, to the fact that we should be looking at all these different aspects together. So uh, the second part of the question, if I understand correctly, was not just how do we conceptualize and how we define, but what would be the approach to deal with academic freedom? And therefore, in this case, I would like to maybe build a bit more on our uh, uh, direct experience. So SAR Italy was established in 2019. We've been working for four years. Uh, Basically, we've tried to contribute to the three pillars of Scholars at Risk as an international network and organization, and the pillars are protection and hosting, advocacy, so advocating for uh, individuals and institutions that are uh, violated in their academic freedom, and also in doing research. And this has meant uh, that we promoted among the 33 now universities that compose the na national section, we've been promoting exchange of information and practices, exchange of knowledge, we've been organizing different events, uh, engaging the academic community, including students, uh, reached out to relevant institutions, including the Ministry of University, the Rector's Conference, uh, and we've been engaging at the EU level, thanks to the European-based uh, office of SAR. So based on uh, the, the approach and definition of academic freedom from the documents and our own uh, uh, experience, uh, I would say that we can only conceive a proper approach if it is holistic and multi-level and in, in concrete mechanism that we can uh, develop for sustained collaboration, that means to really work at different levels. So there is a level which is the internal. What do we do in our universities? Uh, and universities uh, uh, individually, they can really work uh, uh, in, in um, uh, offering concrete forms of solidarity, which includes uh, hosting, protecting scholars, welcoming, but also advocating for the principles and values uh, and engaging the university community, as I said. We can work at the local level. So something that we've done, for instance, uh, with the campaign uh, to support Dr. Jalali, Iranian scholar that has been uh, um, held uh, in Iran uh, and actually in prison uh, under very harsh condition since 2016, that has meant uh, creating collaboration also so with the municipality, with local NGOs, uh, with other entities at the local level, including Amnesty. 
But then, of course, there is a national level. And at the national level, the European University Association calls uh, for clear and consistent regulatory frameworks, uh, uh, refraining from interference in their uh, internal affairs. But at the, at the national level, there is one thing that uh, to us uh, is uh, crucially important at this moment of heightened crisis, and that is the institution of national scholarship uh, program for hosting scholars. Something like this exists in France, the POST program, something exists in Germany, the Philipp Schwarz in initiative. Most other countries do not have such national program and those are crucial. Then of course, there's a possibility to work at the European level by lobbying and also engaging with the different institution and at the international level. So in the end, to sum up, I think uh, an adequate approach to deal with academic freedom, not only in discussion, but action, uh, it's about making the above mentioned documents widely known uh, throughout our uh, uh, institutions to translate those core principles into daily actions uh, at our institution, to participate in networks that operate to promote academic freedom, and I may say something about this later on, and to engage at the different levels, making use of different available resources uh, across those networks. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, right. So academic freedom is also action and we should be as scholars, we should be aware of uh, the existing documents, the ex existing steps and also organizations that are already uh, working and uh, and being very active on, on the ground. So thank you for uh, clarifying all this very important information. Um, I would invite now uh, Olga to contribute. Well, um... Thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this event. Uh, as uh, you know, opposed to other speakers, I do not uh, represent academia in a strict sense of the word because I'm not affiliated with any university. I'm a journalist, first and foremost. Also, I'm an analyst and a non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, but mostly I'm a journalist, so I you know, might not be aware of some like really deep processes inside the, the academy the academia but in fact uh, in preparation to this uh, event today i spoke to several of my colleagues uh, ukrainians who are working in uh, different academic institutions around uh, europe and i asked them what would they you know respond to these questions uh, so i would share some of my um, thoughts and also some of the feedback of uh, these people who are in uh, academia and in research so, uh, you know, first of all, I would like to start with uh, saying that when we uh, discuss academic freedom today, uh, of course, like um, we are mentioning, you know, the freedom in a um, not uh, maybe tangible sense, but in fact, the academic freedom in Ukraine, particularly, in, is now under threat in the most direct sense of the word, because uh, more than 200 uh, education institutions in Ukraine have been destroyed as a result of Russian full-scale invasion since uh, February 24 uh, this year. And more than uh, two, uh, so 200 have been destroyed and more than 2,000 have been damaged. Uh, as a journalist, I've been visiting in the last months uh, several schools in different parts of Ukraine, in those parts that have been damaged in the um, Chernihiv region of Ukraine, in the northern part of the country bordering Belarus. And it's a very, you know, uh, difficult scenes to watch because you, you see the ruins, you see the windows shattered, but you also see the repairmen, how the uh, personnel, you know, the, the teachers, the professors, the principals of the schools, they're working very hard to restore them and to provide children with a chance to continue their education. Of course, we are speaking now about the school education, but the same concerns the universities. And I think Irina will share more, you know, how, how it works in, in the higher education system. So first and foremost, uh, threat to academic freedom in Ukraine is a physical threat from Russian missile attacks, from Russian uh, um, deliberate uh, attacks on Ukrainian education facilities. And it's a, an open question now as the uh, new school year is about to begin in Ukraine, whether uh, these facilities will be safe. Uh, some Ukrainian schools and universities will reopen physically, so the students will be able to attend classes, to be present physically, and when there is an air alert warning, they will go to the shelters uh, to wait it out. But many others will not reopen, will only continue working in the remote format. And this, again, I think is kind of, you know, another constraint that uh, it's, uh, while uh, the whole world is returning after two pandemic years to uh, on-site education, to live education, to interaction 
uh, between uh, students and professors, Ukrainian students are uh, still forced to uh, study in very difficult circumstances, uh, mostly online. So that's one my observation as a journalist. And something that uh, you know, uh, some of my contacts shared with me when uh, reflecting on the academic freedom. Uh, uh, so um, they said that uh, academic freedom is not absolute and it is always uh, connected with re responsibility. So there cannot be uh, you know, an absolute freedom and um, it is not possible that researchers are disconnected from uh, the on the ground reality they live in, from the societies they work for and from their, the uh, topics that they research. So uh, there should always be this feeling of responsibility uh, by you know, uh, researchers and scholars, uh, how what I do, how would I write, how would I, uh, you know, the ideas that I promote, uh, what impact can it have? Like, and am I responsible for the, uh, can I like, am I able to assume responsibility for the consequences they may have? So these were the observations that you know Ukrainian scholars I, I talked with shared with me, and um, I think for now it's all from from me. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. So thank you also for pointing out that um, uh, w the war is an attack to education as well. And so when we talk about reconstruction and. Obviously, when uh, in a post-war situation, when this war will be over, hopefully very soon, reconstruction won't be just a physical reconstruction of buildings, of schools and universities. But as you said, it is necessary to uh, to uh, to build a rebuild the connection and to reconnect researchers to the society they are working for, and also to rebuild education and also rebuild. Uh, the the willingness of people to um, to 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 reconnect and restart their um, working and and researching and studying and teaching. So thank you for pointing out this very important aspect. Uh, so we uh, we stop the first we end the first round with uh, Irina, please. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to appreciate and uh, to express my great, uh, deep, uh, grateful for organizers uh, who give us such opportunity to discuss very important, very crucial topic about academic freedom and the impact of uh, conflicts, armed conflicts, war, uh, war of Russia against Ukraine and uh, the implications for how, uh, higher education for academic freedom, not only um, as for today, you know, uh, the problem uh, that can be uh, immediately, uh, you know, with the results of uh, this can be immediately estimated, but as the uh, problem that can have very, very long-term consequences. And also, I um, appreciate very much uh, organizers that bring Ukrainian flag and um, uh, switch on uh, the lights of Ukrainian flag, uh, especially today, because in Ukraine we are celebrating today uh, the day of national flag. And the next day, the 24th of August, it's Independence Day of Ukraine. That's why for me, I am very honorable to be here to present and to share with you uh, my concerns and uh, of course my thoughts and my concerns and uh, regarding um, <clears throat> the future of uh, Ukraine higher education. And uh, coming back to the, our topic <laughs> of our discussion, uh, let me uh, start with uh, the um, the fact that um, Ukraine have started to discover and to enjoy academic freedom uh, only for less than 30 years. And our way to this phenomena uh, is not easy and straight. First of all, during the Soviet uh, time, the mere expression academic freedom was not in use at all. Everything was centralized and no university could disregard the decision of Ministry of Education that of course received all directions from the top level. Uh, academic institutes, they're deprived of all autonomy and uh, independence. Moreover, many professors were limited 
in the researchers and professional development due to their nationality. And this is the heritage universities in Ukraine dealt for the years. And only the progress in the European integration of Ukraine, especially after um, 2014, um, helped to uh, implement the key principles of academic freedom and to join Bologna process, uh, Horizon Europe and other European Union initiatives. At the same time, and I have to, uh, to mention it, uh, the educational reform in Ukraine is still on the table. And among the main questions to be discussed by the experts and academia is academic freedom, its strengths and weaknesses for Ukraine in particular. Um, in general, for Ukraine, for Ukrainian academia, uh, academic freedom is about the freedom of research and teach, the way of research and teach, the freedom of academic exchange and dissemination, um, the freedom of academic and cultural expressions and exchange, uh, exchanges, the institutional, uh, autonomy of universities and, of course, uh, the uh, students' self-governance. Uh, and um, unfortunately, we are still very far from the um, maybe European level of academic freedom because um, university uh, um, I'm, uh, are still receive a lot of uh, directions, rules, and. Um, <clears throat> other uh, kind of recommendations from the Ministry of Education. And uh, unfortunately, um, maybe we will go, uh, speak about, about, about this later. All these uh, recommendations are dependent on political situation. But in general, speaking about um, academic freedom, from my personal view, I would like to mention that for me, uh, academic freedom uh, is, yes, I agree with previous uh, speakers that uh, academic freedom is uh, people's right and opportunity to, to freely pursue and benefit from science. But at the same time, for me, speaking about, uh, speaking as a professor, as a university teacher, it's a very high level of responsibility as well. Um, because as professor, you are responsible, you know, to find, to keep the balance between the way of teaching you would like to use, to implement, uh, you prefer. Uh, the um, way of your opinion, personal opinion expressions, we are human, so all our expressions, all our estimations contain some kind of personal uh, perceptions. Uh, and to balance this with students' rights, students' cultural, historical, religion, national uh, peculiarities. And it's really, really sometimes a very difficult um, task. So that's why I'm speaking about responsibility as well. Of course, for university, I do uh, believe it's as well right and responsibility to determine its educational mission free from government intervention. At the same time, and again, I'm speaking from the point of view, you know, or Ukrainian experience, and it's not about today's, but it's from the uh, 1991, from the independence, proclamation of independence of Ukraine. The state's point, the point uh, that the justification of academic freedom um, is not about the comfort or convenience for teachers, professors, and students, but is about the benefit for society as well. And of course, sometimes that can lead to the interference of the state into the education process. Therefore, 
I would like to speak maybe at the, this point, mostly and foremost about the freedom to teach, study, and pursue knowledge and research without unreasonable interference or restrictions from authorities, from law, from any kind of institutional organizations, political groups, and public pressure. And here, stress this last um, uh, point, uh, I refer mostly to the current situation in Ukraine, you know, because uh, looking forward um, and com uh, compare with uh, the situation uh, I <clears throat> had following um, since 2014 it's very important you know to uh, to avoid uh, public uh, emotional pressure on higher education as well because it lead uh, not to it leads not to balance and uh, um, so called um, free education system but to depend to the system that depend on political mode and political situation in the current um, period of time or in the some kind of period of times. And thank you for your attention. I will stop now for. The... Okay, thank you, Irina. So, so thank you for uh, for stressing the fact that there's a sense of responsibility connected to our profession as scholars. We should be a bit more aware of the responsibility that we have. Uh, so after this, uh, this first round or uh, let's say more um, uh, abstract ideas on uh, academic freedom uh, from a definition and approaches, I would like to ask all speakers uh, to um, go uh, a bit more um, deeper into uh, practical issues and problems that are making um, academic freedom a rising concern. Um, so there are so many issues that are challenging academic freedom, um, especially when it comes to the uh, scholarly community of political scientists and international relations scholars, European studies and all the, the field, our, our fields. Um, we see many, uh, many uh, issues coming on. Uh, so obviously we have discussed about the war in Ukraine, but also conflicts, uh, conflicts are worse and, and uh, are obviously um, producing an impact. But at the same time, we see in, uh, in, in Europe other phenomena like the rise of populism, which is not uh, just contemporary, it's already started quite a little uh, while ago, uh, and also the phenomenon like backsliding of uh, the rise of um, illiberal waves uh, uh, more often. So uh, there are several phenomena that are producing an impact and they are making academic freedom a rising concern. So um, once again, according to your ideas and expertise and experience, I would like to know from you so which uh, factors uh, and causes and problems are making academic freedom uh, a rising concern. Uh, so we start again with the same order and then we will open to the floor uh, for, for questions and then we'll reverse the order. So I will invite Nona to, to start. I'll start. And first I'd like to say to Olga and Irina that what they tell us is terrible and it makes me feel extremely privileged very safely in France when I hear about the problem of academic freedom in Ukraine. So the way I understood the question there were which are the causes and factors that explain the attacks against the problems we have today in Europe. And I would say first, there's the global expansion of authoritarian regimes at the expense of democracy. And that's a, a threat for all freedoms, including academic research. The last report of Freedom House uh, 2021 called Democracy Under Siege is really impressive because the number of countries uh, where the scores on their index has been declining in the last 16 years have outnumbered those who scored improved. That's something new. And uh, today they count that some 38% of the global population lives in definitely not free countries, the highest proportion since 1997. So that's a general context of uh, decline, erosion of freedoms. And 
Of course, uh, in these countries, we have so many academics who are put in jail, tortured. I think of my colleague Inar Selek in Turkey, sometimes killed. And also that means that one of the problems for academic freedom is so many countries now uh, make research impossible. I think of my colleague uh, Fariba Adelka, who has been now for three years imprisoned in Iran. She just went there to do her research and she is still there. Or even uh, worse, the young Italian uh, PhD student, Giulio Regeni, kidnapped and killed in Egypt. So it makes, uh, even if in our countries we are kind of preserved in the Western settings, that makes it more and more difficult to do research uh, across the borders. And as you mentioned before, there is that increasing gray zone with illiberal democracies like Hungary and Poland, where you have electoral democracy, but you don't have the basic freedoms and rights, no pluralism, attacks against minorities, the opposition, the free press, the NGOs, courts, medias. And the common picture would be nationalism. That means that these countries place their laws above international rules and conventions. Hungary about the Central European University, they don't recognize the European laws. They consider that their laws prevail. So that's one of the problems. And I would say that we have something more general if we go further, the roots would be in a backlash of globalization, a reflex of closure, fear, economic, cultural, political fears that fuels nationalism and populism. And it fuels anti-immigrant stands. And also there's the backlash of post-materialist values, because the very success of a greater acceptance of the rights of minorities, of women, of gays, is bringing a conservative backlash. And that's also something that's bad for research. In France, for instance, uh, we, all the researchers who are working on these issues are delegitimized, considered as taking their size as doing militant research about women, minorities, race. So that's one of the, the causes of the problem. The, the success and collapse of somebody like Eric Zemmour in the last French presidential election is a good example of that very conservative backlash against rights that we had thought achieved. And uh, all the research exploring these inequalities is accused in France, for instance, to essentialize differences, to ethnicize society, to contribute to its fragmentation. And another aspect I think important is terrorism because things have been getting worse since 9-11 and in France since the, the uh, attacks of uh, 2015. Because uh, at the Bataclan and uh, Charlie Hebdo, research on Islam or, is or prejudice, is accused of taking the sides of the enemies of the Republic, described as islamo leftist That means that the attacks against academic freedom are part of a global regression of rights in democracies in their war against terrorism. And we are secondary consequences of that in research. Delegitimizing the work of many researchers as islamo leftist as traitors, as non-patriots. And it's a very divisive they're very divisive issue because it cuts through the left-right cleavage. In the past, there always were attacks against academic freedom, but it mostly came from the right and the far right. And now it comes from the center left. It comes from people like Manuel Valls, Emmanuel Macron, Blanquer, Vidal, and it divides the academic community. So that's something we must keep in mind. Last, I would say that there is the social media are one of the elements of the problem because they amplify. Uh, they immediately, research results are spread out in the social networks and also sometimes the content of courses and their authors are exposed. What they do is dissected, mocked, distorted, out of context. And that's also an element frightening for uh, academic freedom taken out of their context. So. Uh, What's gone has been going on in Sciences Po Paris or Sciences Po Grenoble is quite a good example of uh, these dangers. And I'll maybe stop there. Thank you. Claudia? 
Yes, thanks. Um, I think as we're dealing with the academic freedom as a, as a global issue, then of course there are some European uh, features maybe, but in order to understand uh, the volume and nature of attacks, uh, it's also good to know that there are some uh, monitoring exercises that are available, mm -hmm. uh, some documents and reports that we can look at. And I would like to mention here the Free to Think report, which is published by mm -hmm. Scholars at Risk every year since two, uh, 2015, which is based on uh, the Academic Freedom uh, uh, Monitoring Project. So uh, the Free to Think report 2021 mm -hmm. refers uh, documents, uh, 332 attacks on higher education communities uh, in 65 countries. And, mm -hmm. and maybe we should also remind uh, that between 2011 and 2021, more than 2,150 attacks have happened in 113 countries. And of course, the monitoring project and the report, uh, it only deals uh, with some of those uh, attacks that are uh, detail uh, specific. So there's a lot that is not... Uh, grasped uh, by this kind of exercise. But I think it's also uh, maybe useful to refer to the type of violations that are included in there so that we understand what kind of attack, uh, um, depending on the different situation. And as we were saying, of course, context uh, is highly relevant. So the monitoring project and the report, they refer to six types of violations. Uh, which includes killing, violence, and disappearance. Uh, Giulio Regeni was mentioned, of course, uh, uh, there are a number of other instances, uh, and these are violations that may um, be uh, conducted uh, in, uh, to, to the expenses of education, uh, higher education leaders, uh, professors, academic and non-academic, uh, and higher education students as well. Uh, a second type is wrongful imprisonment and detention, so arrest, interrogation, detention, prosecution of scholars and students. A third type is wrongful prosecution, civil and criminal proceedings uh, against uh, all these different uh, components of higher education. A fourth one is restriction on travel and movement, so improper travel restriction on higher education, uh, legal, administrative, physical restriction on travel within a state, uh, even difficulties for scholars and students' ability to, to obtain visa. I think this is something that we are very much experiencing in our uh, own uh, context and universities. And then, of course, there are different forms of harassment, coercion, uh, intimidation. Interestingly, the, the Global Observatory on Academic Freedom that I was mentioning before also refers uh, to a situation in which, in the face of such dire sanctions, uh, more insidious attacks on academic freedom tend to remain unnoticed, uh, including insecurity of employment. So maybe precarity is something that we should consider as also affecting the academic freedom that we enjoy, bullying on social media, which was just mentioned, and forms of uh, self-censorship. So uh, the Free to Think report, of course, looks at the situation which is uh, getting worse uh, in many different countries, including particularly over the last two years, uh, India, Brazil, uh, um, and, uh, and others. Uh, but of course, it also reports uh, some of the instances and uh, uh, events uh, that have been taking place uh, in Europe. Uh, just to name, to mention a few, in Turkey, uh, where we know, of course, the situation has been highly difficult for a number of scholars and colleagues uh, that, have, uh, that are now hosted at our universities. Uh, President Erdogan placed a political ally as rector of Istanbul Bogazishi University this year, and that has raised lots of concern, a demonstration by students and support also from the international side. In the United States, uh, we have, uh, and this is something that we've also witnessed, racist and derogatory language and imagery disrupting um, to shut down online events uh, when it is maybe, you know, Black History Month uh, or when some of the issues that Nona was mentioning are discussed uh, in the public sphere. In the Netherlands, professors from Leiden University have been intimidated as part of campaigns organized by right-wing parties. In Hungary in 2020, a law was passed uh, uh, which uh, moved the University of Theater and Film Arts and then 11 other public universities uh, into the hands of private individuals. Uh, so public universities actually being um, uh, 
uh, reorganized uh, so that it's pri private uh, individuals and very often closely connected uh, uh, to the governments and and uh, and Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Uh, and in Belarus, of course, uh, there's uh, ongoing continuous uh, struggles uh, and uh, forms of attack against scholars and students who've opposed the election of uh, uh, President Lukashenko in 2020. So trends in de-democratization have been mentioned already and the Freedom House report. I would like to also mention as we are looking at the causes of all this and why the situation is actually um, becoming even worse, uh, the uh, Reporté Sans Frontiers Sans Frontier WordPress Freedom Index uh, in 2022 indicates polarization and the role of media therein, uh, and of course the information chaos that has been created by unregulated online uh, information. But when it comes to violation of academic freedom, also we do have some, uh, again, data and references. And in this case, I would like to mention the Academic Freedom Index, uh, which was recently created uh, as a joint collaboration between University of Gothenburg's VDEM Institute, together with the Global Institute uh, for Public Policy uh, in Germany. And this is, a, it's an interesting tool uh, whereby we can actually look up, we invite our students to do this, uh, to look at what is the situation in our own countries and how our countries uh, are um, uh, featuring in that context, uh, even in a longitudinal uh, uh, way so that we can go back uh, uh, some, some decades and see what the situation has become. And the situation is now that the, the overall uh, uh, level and de degree of academic freedom worldwide uh, seems to be more or less uh, at the same time uh, that it was in 1980. So even in this case, we see backlash. The other thing that we may consider is uh, if and how these different trends uh, backslide in democracy, backslide in freedom of expression and backslide uh, in, in academic freedom, if they are connected. And again, the uh, the Global Observatory uh, talks about academic freedom as at the same time a criterion and a guardian of democracy. So they are indeed connected. And maybe meaningful to remind that as far as the academic freedom index, one of the indicators uh, that is actually experiencing the worst uh, situation in decline is precisely the freedom of academic and cultural expression. So that's strictly relate to freedom of expression. But of course, uh, there is no causal sequences, uh, and, and this is actually an area where a lot more research uh, could be uh, conducted precisely to see where these uh, connections are happening. The very last point I would like to make, we, we tend to look at macro uh, trends and macro dynamics, uh, but here again, I would like to take it back to our experience and the, and the reality and the daily life of our universities. Uh, and so I'm always wondering to what extent uh, the core values of higher education are actually discussed, promoted, and made public in our universities. How often that, does that happen? How often we discuss this with students? Uh, how do we understand academic autonomy in relation to the evolving geopolitical situation? So the directive that have come from the European context and also the national context at times uh, over the last few months have affected and impacted directly the institutional autonomy of our own universities. This is maybe something we should discuss. And then the other point is in our daily life, uh, when we are all involved uh, uh, and fostering internationalization, to what extent do we think that internationalization should also be conceived as responsible internationalization and therefore taking academic freedom into consideration when we do uh, develop new uh, partnership and new agreements? Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, now, Olga. Yes, thank you. Well, I would like to bring Ukraine back into the discussion. This is the topic of the event. So, you know, uh, listening to other speakers and also reflecting on what uh, I previously said, I, I thought that I would like to add one more point to, uh, you know, the definition and the challenges to the academic freedom that uh, now, well, Ukraine is facing, because I'm speaking about Ukrainian experience, first of all. So, uh, uh, you know, what we are seeing, what is happening on the territories that Russia has uh, temporarily occupied, is that uh, Russia is uh, very quick to move to a weaponized education system there to uh, make it a tool of uh, propaganda and to replace the Ukrainian curriculum both in schools and at the universities with the Russian one. And of course, in the Russian curriculum, Ukraine is presented as an artificial state, a state that doesn't have a right to exist. So, uh, you know, and, and they are doing it very fast, like uh, even before uh, restoring some uh, 
essential uh, electricity or water supplies in the cities that are under occupation and that have been destroyed by Russian shelling, such as Mariupol, Russians are very quickly bringing uh, teachers from inside Russia uh, very often or from the occupied Crimea to uh, uh, replace the curriculum and to, you know, start with like, this indoctrination of uh, the students in this, uh, under this occupational administration. So uh, this is uh, related to, uh, you know, the risk of uh, the expansion of authoritarianism that Nona mentioned previously, you know, we shouldn't be like discounting uh, uh, this challenge, which is so obvious now in Ukraine, which is very raw and very uh, direct, but it also exists in other academic institutions in the Western democracies. You know, or we know about uh, the attempts of Russia and China to interfere the academic institutions, to weaponize academic programs, also, uh, you know, uh, via some funding that is offered, generous funding, and we know that uh, uh, cash-strapped uh, academic institutions sometimes uh, do not have much uh, room for maneuver and they accept these co cooperation offers or at least they attended to do the, uh, that in uh, in the uh, past years. Hopefully now there will be more realization also of the dangers of how it works because um, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine and the West is not just a conventional war. It's a war that is being conducted at many levels, also with the use of hybrid techniques, such as uh, um, uh, disinformation and also weaponization of uh, education and of academia and of uh, the context and the freedoms that the, uh, you know, the academics, uh, academic institutions enjoy, also academic cooperation between um, institutions, academic institutions inside inside Russia and China, and and the Western ones, and uh, you know, um, expanding on this point, I would like to mention uh, several problems that uh, this Russian full scale invasion of Ukraine made uh, very clear. Uh, I think uh, the first uh, issue is that uh, it made very clear that there is a big lack of expertise on Ukraine. Uh, many. Uh, academic programs that um, had at the center uh, the region of Central Europe and, uh, uh, and Russia were actually mostly Russian focused. There is a very significant uh, Russia centrism, I would like to say, um, in, you know, in any research and studies on, uh, on the region of Central and Eastern Europe. So I also can share my personal experience. I'm a graduate of a master program at the University of Bologna in Italy uh, that had a, as a topic, you know, the uh, studies of Central and Eastern Europe. But in fact, that program was mostly focused on Russia and the Balkans. There were, of course, some courses related to the Baltic states or um, Poland. But in fact, it was like really marginal compared to the percentage of attention dedicated to Russia. And very often uh, the analysis of the region is made through the prism of Russia. And the uh, interpretation of history of the region is also very often Russian. Uh, absurdly, at one of the conferences, it was about 10 years ago, so I hope that things changed. So at one of the conferences uh, on Ukraine that was uh, hosted in, uh, by the University of Bologna in cooperation with some other universities, uh, there was only one Ukrainian speaker and all the other speakers were either Russians or Western professors. I hope really that this has changed, but and it, if, it is, if it has not, I think now is the high time to change it. And again, a quote in my contacts in the academia uh, who shared their thoughts, you know, they are speaking about this urgent need to decolonize the uh, Central and Eastern European studies and to uh, uh, realize that um, this Russian-centric view of the region is something very obsolete. You know, this Russian imperialistic lens uh, uh, and view of the history of uh, Ukraine, Poland, Baltic states, and, you know, other uh, countries that formerly belonged to the Soviet Union or were part of the communist bloc should be abandoned. Uh, there should be a realization that Russia is an imperial power uh, not very different from uh, the colonial and imperialist powers, uh, uh, you know, that were there, uh, that Western countries were uh, once uh, decades of years ago. I think there is not uh, enough realization about that in the academia uh, at the moment. And speaking of decolonization, like another welcome step would be, uh, while there are so many centers of Russian studies in various um, Western universities, there are very few centers of Ukrainian studies. 
and, and this is something that I think is very relevant at, the, at, at this point, because as I said, like the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fact that very few researchers, analysts, scholars were able to predict it, were able to predict a collapse of Russian army that we are basically witnessing, uh, uh, who were predicting very quick Ukraine's defeat, who were not understanding the uh, processes within Ukrainian society that actually make Ukraine so resilient and you know allow Ukraine to be resistant for six months of the invasion. I think this is a really very uh, loud warning bell for the, uh, for the academia and for the scholarly community. So more centers of Ukrainian studies should be there. And also the, this uh, fascination uh, with Russia that still exists in some academic circles. And, you know, in the first days after the Russian full-scale invasion, I was contacted by uh, a professor of one of uh, European, prominent European universities, a history professor. Like we, we studied together on the master's degree and he apologized. He said, I was so wrong because I looked at the whole you know, history of Ukraine and the situation in Ukraine from the prism of Russia. So I was, I, it was very brave and I really admire that you know, he stepped up and apologized and it, for, to me as a Ukrainian and to Ukrainian people. And I hope that there is still, that this self-reflection will not be limited by this like initial outrage in the first like days and weeks after Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, but that there will be a honest and honest debate inside the academia about all the biases, you know, about uh, all this Russian-centric view, about this treating Ukraine uh, and Ukrainians and other Central Eastern Europeans uh, as uh, objects rather than subjects. So I think there is a way to go in terms of, uh, of this. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for pointing out such important things. Uh, so now we end the second round with Irina. Thank you. <clears throat> it's very difficult to uh, speak on this topic after such prominent experts uh, who have already mentioned really the most important, uh, the most important uh, points and uh, cases and factors. Uh, and thank you, Claudia, for um, owning with uh, a lot of uh, practical researchers on these uh, issues that uh, just uh, uh, not, not um, made it uh, made all these uh, factors more reasonable. And uh, we really have to pay uh, attention to these. Uh, from my point of view, I would like maybe uh, just to um, uh, mention the several one, uh, several factors. Um, and uh, first of all, um, I'm absolutely agree that uh, there are a lot of factors that lead to um, after criticism and. Uh, this uh, process is one of the most uh, important and the most uh, um, challenge for academic freedom. Why? Uh, let me uh, <clears throat> uh, share with you uh, my reasons why I'm thinking uh, on this. First of all, um, the after criticization is, uh, in many cases, it's a result of um, instability sense of a uh, rising uh, sense of instability inside the country as well as in the region. Uh, so that um, that is, you know, like a um, tool of state self-protection to impose more strict rules, more strict uh, laws, to control the situation inside the country, to uh, avoid political instability, to stabilize social situation, and to prevent economic crisis. Because all of these factors in separately or in combination for sure will create instability and can lead to a cost uh, internal conflict that can be used by external factors. And Ukraine is a good example for, of this situation. Now we are talking about the growing process of authorization in Ukraine, and that's true, unfortunately. But it's the reason of external situation. It's a way to protect nation, 
and country. It's some kind of existential uh, a tool to, um, to protect a existential uh, right of Ukraine and Ukrainian people to be alive. Um, and I absolutely agree that, uh, unfortunately, um, the uh, democr de uh, democratic uh, decline is one of the reasons for all this situation. Uh, another uh, factor that we, um, from my point of view, we can also add to our list, it's uh, weakness of international law and how to enforce international law, international organizations as well in the current situation and how it can help to strengthen academic freedom as well. Um, one of our reasons that can be um, also owed to the list maybe it's um, multiculturalism as well. Yes, we get a lot from this policy. But at the same time, Hungary uh, has been mentioned in our discussion. It's like, again, a state attempt to protect national cultural traditions as a tool for authorities, you know, to, um, to, to win uh, the next election. And again, we are coming back to populism. And that's, you know, many of these factors, they are very, very dependent on each other. They, it, it's like a, uh, like a chain with different uh, uh, links between them. And uh, again, uh, speaking about um, sense of uh, insecurity and instability, um, I guess it's again one of the reason for um, the um, new democracies. Let me use such kind of expression. And uh, now we can uh, talk about uh, the Eastern and Central European countries and Ukraine as well. Uh, you see, uh, the uh, in Ukrainian case, I can remember or just to sh um, uh, show some uh, evidence, uh, some uh, examples for you uh, that um, can also just demonstrate that uh, current uh, after uh, criticization process, it's um, it's like self-protection. Of course, it's not an excuse, but we have to, you know, to to think about it and to or maybe to think about it as how to um, how to limit, how, how to decline these uh, uh, insecurity and instability mood and uh, sense in our country. For example, uh, Olga um, <clears throat> told, uh, um, uh, gave us very good uh, examples regarding uh, Russia-oriented studies in Eastern European countries. Uh, but from my point of view, you know, why Poland, Baltic countries, why Romania, the uh, Romanian university are so Russia uh, oriented, uh, why they have a lot of programs, because they feel this very, very high level of insecurity. And, uh, you know, in... Um, Several uh, months ago, um, <clears throat> I was a witness of a uh, talk between our Lithuanian colleagues and uh, Ukrainian and Lithuanian colleagues, and they were uh, strongly uh, sure that after Ukraine, we will be next, despite of Lithuania is a NATO member. Poland, the same. You know, since 1990, a lot of Polish politicians, military officials stressed that Ukraine is the last battlefield before Poland. 
after Ukraine, Poland will be next. And independent, secure, and um, stable Ukraine is a guarantee for democratic, stable, secure Poland. For Romania as well. Uh, you know, after 2014, uh, then Russia started um, militarization of uh, Crimea Peninsula and Black Sea. The Romania was and still is the most uh, pursue uh, the most um, active lobby uh, of NATO present and hence in the Black Sea, just because they always repeat that distance between Crimea and Romania is only 300 kilometers. It's the, of, of course, uh, in comparison with Baltic countries, it's uh, much more, but in any, uh, any case, it's, it's very important for them. And, you know, they are trying to continue to um, uh, be so uh, Russia oriented uh, because they had learned the lessons from the previous history. Unfortunately, we didn't. We didn't learn. And to the, uh, uh, the latest events, I guess the majority of uh, Ukrainians believe that it's impossible Russia would attack Ukraine. We are brother nations. We, are, we have very close relations. We are very connected between families. But we didn't learn our lessons. You see, one, just one very short um, example. <clears throat> um, as a um, research fellow of Odessa branch uh, of National Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, we uh, tried, you know, to pay attention to Black Sea security, to Black Sea um, <clears throat> uh, cooperation and other things related to, um, in general, Ukraine's development, security and uh, international cooperation. And we was just one, only one of such kind of branch, it was Odessa branch. And uh, then we try, you know, to... Um, elaborated the uh, Russia uh, cooperation with Russia and Black Sea, Black Sea economic cooperation and the other Black Sea um, organizations. Uh, the Kyiv uh, headquarters told us that no, we had Crimea branch and they deal their Russia issues. But in 2009, uh, it was the first wave of uh, uh, world uh, financial economic crisis that came to Ukraine, Crimea branch was the first one to be closed. And no one after Crimea deal, dealt with Russia issues. So we didn't, you know, follow the situation in Russia on the high level, because National Institute of Strategic Studies, it was the main uh, think tank, of course, uh, think tank in um, uh, some way, uh, very close to um, presidential administration to elaborate recommendation for foreign and security policy. So that's why I'm thinking that uh, um, the situation with um, we, uh, and me personally uh, faced since 2014, then academic uh, research. Uh, and uh, most of all research were limited, unofficially limited by using Russia academic papers and researchers. It was wrong decision because we lost a lot and we didn't pay enough attention to the situation with uh, Russia and uh, all these, uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> uh, the uh, so consequences we face now. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for to all speakers for bringing so many uh, um, insights on the table. So now 
uh, we are um, ready to open the floor to questions and comments. Yes, please. There should be uh, students helping, assisting us with microphones. Uh, there are two, well, I see two hands, yeah, here and there. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Vera Aksonova. I'm a Marie Curie Revive Fellow at the University of Vienna. But before that, I was for two years managing director of the Academics and Solidarity and Mentoring Program for at Risk and Displaced Scholars in Germany. And I wanted to point to a paradoxical situation that we are facing right now in countries like Germany, who, are, who have become safe heavens for displaced scholars. Uh, since 2015, Germany has developed and established a number of programs, including the Philip Schwartz Initiative, that were supporting and continue to support displaced scholars in Germany. However, what we are facing right now in, in the context of the war of the Russian war in Ukraine is that the funding for those programs is being cut either completely uh, or partly as a consequence uh, of overall cut of research funding at the federal level. So my question to all of you is how to deal with such paradoxical situations and how we as a scholarly community can meaningfully respond to such paradoxes. Thank you. There's another question there. Thank you for a very interesting uh, panel. Uh, my name is Eroslava Barbieri. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Birmingham. Um, my question is primarily directed at Nona and Olha, but if other panelists want to chip in, please do. I wanted to ask you whether you agree with the observation that there's a fundamental tension between academic freedom and the commitment to the search of objective truth that Nona pointed out at the beginning. Um, because especially when we analyze conflicts and the war in Ukraine in particular, I believe that that same academic freedom almost became synonymous with ultra relativism that ended up putting on the same plane, you know, Ukrainian narratives and Russian narratives about the war since 2014. And that greatly contributed to our misunderstanding of the situation in Ukraine and everyone's shock to 2022. So how do we basically solve this tension? And believe me, it's a deeply uncomfortable question for me to ask as someone who believes, you know, as, as being a liberal to her core. But essentially, how do we, uh, as academics, do we have to start asking ourselves the same questions that journalists did in the light of populism and post-truth? And how do we square our commitment to objective truth and this idea that there's no objective truth and different narratives have to be, you know, put on an equal plane and giving equal um, uh, merit? And just a follow up comment, I wanted to express my gratitude to Olha for, um, you know, explaining the actual impact of the war on education and how many of those especially left leaning academics who, you know, embrace the narrative that the war in 2014 was a secessionist um, uh, war and not an interstate war and accuse Ukraine of promoting a very monolithic understanding of facts fail to point out the monolithic nature of the Russian world narrative and how in the occupied territories, Ukrainian language, literature, history have been completely expunged from the curricula and how in the newly occupied territories, parents are being told that if they don't agree for their kids to move to Russian standards, their kids will be deported to Russia. And so essentially, um, I believe that we as academic need to ask ourselves very uncomfortable questions, looking ourselves in the mirror in realizing that academic narratives can have a big impact on journalists and therefore public opinion and policymakers and therefore international um, politics. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Yes, please. Hello, my name is Olga Litvak. I work at the University of Vienna as well. And um, I have a question, I think, to all of you coming back to this situation with the lack of the centers research in specific countries and the quality of education in general. So my personal observation as well would be that we don't have 
good uh, scholars in the countries of origin like Ukraine, even in Russia, you don't really have good, so many good scholars who are uh, active on the international arena, who are acknowledged as scholars on the international arena due to the lack of many, maybe very few institutions that can uh, teach as well as, for example, some Western institutions, and also due to the lack of financial support, of course, especially for early career researchers. And in many countries uh, in the Eastern neighborhood in Russia, European Union and international programs, I would not agree with the point of kind of influence from Russia, but the other way around for many universities, it was kind of way to provide some independent research for some time, especially the EU funding, which was closed. And just to point out a few years ago, the ECPR also came up with a statement for the European University in St. Petersburg, which was targeted many times in Russia, and many Russian scholars now have to leave Russia as well. So what would you say on this financial side, whether we should scrap the programs like it happened now? And of course, there are reasons to do so, because we can argue that the scholars didn't really um, managed to combat the propaganda machine and do their job, or whether we should try and provide research funding to the countries as well, or to the scholars at risk from the countries like Russia, Belarus, which you mentioned as well, or Kazakhstan. There are so many countries in the post-Soviet space where we still have researchers who might be able to influence it in some way. Thank you. I don't see any, oh yeah, the last one there. And then we close with the last round. And we have one, one question, someone here online. Thank you very much. I'm Sophie Gude from the University of York. And my remark is in line with uh, Nona Meyer uh, speech about what happened to academic freedom in France. But then my question really, addresses all of the panelists. Um, before moving to the UK, I was teaching in Sciences Po X, uh, which was not particularly uh, like a center of big debates at the time, but I could notice, and this really scared me, how sensitive, how responsive students were to historical revisionism because I was uh, teaching European history at the time and how delicate it was to critically engage them with uh, like what they would label as liberal, um, like deconstructed historiographies and how strongly they rejected um, the, let's say the national myth and um, yes, the introduction of uh, critical instruments in the study of history. And since transmission is and teaching is the other side of the coin of what we do as researchers, I was wondering how can we give students the means to also like engage into the defense and the preservation of academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you. And now, now we also add there's someone in um, in the chat. I think it's more a, a comment and a question. Uh, Roberto Cantoni, I don't know if you can read also on the screen, uh, is telling that the word patriot, which until 10 years ago would only be used by Polish nationalists in the EU, is being adopted by a large number of EU political right list and it's used today as if this concept still made sense. Even the center left in some cases has adopted the patriotic jargon. It's not a question, it's a comment. So um, and now with all these uh, extremely uh, relevant questions and comments, I would ask the speakers to very briefly uh, react to them. And I also ask to reverse the order. Uh, so Irina, would you be the one to start? Thank you. Mm, thank you um, to all uh, for your questions and uh, remarks. Um, first of all, um, 
speaking about the paradox of replaced uh, scholarship, you, you know, uh, it's a very difficult question, very difficult. And uh, um, again, speaking as a university professor, for me, uh, the question about replaced uh, scholars and uh, students, first of all, you know, because uh, my, um, it has as a sense because I would like to come back my students. I want to continue to work with them, to work for my country. Of course, I am very proud of them and I'm very happy they have such uh, opportunity, uh, you know, to have new experience, to study at the European University, to have, uh, to have contact with uh, uh, different European uh, uh, professors, uh, teachers and uh, students as well. It, it, it means very, very much. First of all, for them, for their personal experience, for their development as students and as human. And uh, I'm very hope that uh, the situation in Ukraine can soon turn to be much, much better. And uh, we can come back to this issue, to this problem with more uh, bright perspectives. And uh, about uh, lack of good scholars uh, to teach um, uh, from the Eastern Europe country is, if I um, understood your question correct, uh, in the European universities. Yeah. Uh, yes, the problem is that um, Ukrainian universities, unfortunately, do not provide financial assistance to uh, their professors to go for scholarship, uh, fellowship, or even to take part uh, participation in the conferences. And this is the problem for academic freedom in Ukraine as well. And for students as well, you know, because very limited number of professors and students in Ukraine can allow by themselves to pay for uh, travel, travel and uh, accommodation costs. It's, it's uh, the difference, you know, of level of uh, living. Uh, so it's a very good question, and I hope that uh, maybe in future, uh, together with the European Union partners and un university partners, we uh, can discuss this issue and maybe to find some kind of solution. Uh, maybe, I don't know, to use the formula we use now for uh, European Union models and uh, Jean Manet models and European Union um, horizon, uh, horizon Europe projects, you know, then university uh, can contribute just a part of all costs and the, the, the other will cover with uh, the European Union partners. Thank you. Thank you. Olga, please. Yes, I would like first of all to react to and to answer to Yaroslava's question, which I think is very relevant and you know very pressing. Well, of course, uh, people from the academia would be more entitled, you know, to uh, say whether uh, there should be more like self self reflection and lessons learned uh, from the mistakes made. But you know, as someone like as and as a journalist who also sees it from the perspective of you know doing journalism reporting and also uh, as a, someone who's researching disinformation that's my another like area of expertise i can uh, uh, you know i can just agree with the the fact that uh, you know, there must be uh, some self-reflection over uh, how uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine has been um, uh, represented, narrated, and uh, uh, studied, uh, you know, in the, in the academic circles. We are seeing now, uh, after the full-scale invasion, that the so-called realist school, you know, that try to uh, explain uh, Putin's actions in this uh, completely like realist, uh, realistic approach that he will not take risks. He is, you know, he's a realist. We are seeing a complete failure of this approach. And we are also seeing that people who failed to, uh, you know, make uh, correct predictions, they also failed to take responsibility for their previous failures and to admit that they were wrong. Worse uh, than that, they continue peddling a dangerous narrative, which you know has turned to be completely false and untrue and does not correspond to the reality. And they are still treated with uh, a lot of respect. They're getting invited to uh, prominent universities to have open lectures. Uh, so I will not make names here, but I, I think you all uh, 
have in mind, like who, who at least is following the, the war in Ukraine, know what is what is happening, who, who are these people that I'm referring to. And another thing is also, I think, is the use of language, you know, how we call this. Do we call this war in Ukraine? Do we call this Ukraine crisis, which is like the worst possible? Do we call it Ukraine conflict? I think it all starts with that. There should be also an appropriate use of words. This is not, you know, Ukraine crisis. This is not Ukraine conflict. This is a Russian war against Ukraine, Russian aggression against Ukraine that did not start this year, that started in 2014. There are no Russian-backed separatists. There are Russian proxy forces. Who uh, There was no grassroots separatist movement in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions prior to 2014. And I think this fact was also not reflected in a lot of like ac academic scholarly research and writings on, uh, on this war. And again, you know, coming back uh, to my point that I made previously, uh, there is a, a very slow um, you know, or, there is a reluctancy to acknowledge this war as an imperial war of, con of conquest uh, and uh, or the actions of Russia as those uh, as of imperial colonial power. This, I think, is something that uh, uh, should be, you know, uh, uh, eventually done and hopefully soon, sooner than later. And, uh, and also to the question about, uh, you know, whether uh, the academia should expand the programs and offer more places to scholars and uh, researchers from Russia, Belarus, and other authoritarian states. Well, I think uh, maybe it's not the appropriate moment to ask, uh, you know, to talk about that, especially if there is a defic deficit of funding. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a high time to embrace uh, more scholars from Ukraine, from Baltic states, from the states of Central Europe, because if we look at what they were writing, what they were saying in the last years, it will turn out that actually they were making the correct predictions and their expertise is the one that should be highlighted and they should be given more opportunities. So if there are priorities to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, defined, I think this should be a priority. And the final point, um, there is very often this um, premature call to uh, dialogue between uh, Ukrainian and Russian academics, Ukrainian and Russian cultural uh, 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 figures, uh, even journalists. I participated also in several events where, you know, Russian colleagues, liberal, Russian liberal journalists were invited and without going to, into details, I can say it was not the most pleasant experience. Uh, I think there is this lack of sensitivity very often uh, in the West as to what the feelings of Ukrainians are at this point, that they can be traumatized, you know, if they are invited to the same events with, with Russians who might not be at this particular event expressing some like aggressive positions, but they might be like privately, but even if they are not still, I think it should be the, the, the uh, emotions and the situation uh, of Ukrainians should be taken consideration of. They should be asked at least, you know, before like being put on the same panel with uh, Russians, whether they are okay with that. So these calls to dialogue are really premature. And we are talking about people, of course, like those Russians who oppose uh, the regime and who, are, uh, uh, who do not support the war in Ukraine, because this is not also something that is given, you know, it's, it's not always uh, uh, the case. Uh, so I think there should be uh, more sensitivity uh, and just the point that I always make, give more uh, floor, more voices to, uh, to Ukrainians, give them a chance to speak for themselves, treat them as subjects, not as objects of research. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, mm. Many, many things have been mentioned. I don't think we have that much time. We may continue the conversation, of course, later on. So I would like to just uh, uh, maybe make reference to a few things uh, uh, which I think are relevant. In relation to the tension between academic freedom and, and pursuit of truth, uh, of course, there's tension. Um, all situations are uh, different. So the situated approach, of course, uh, requires that we try to understand how is that happening. Uh, there is, of course, a responsibility for a professional association like this one and, and the contribution even at the national level that we have in defining using the, the words, uh, proper words uh, and defining, uh, you know, academic freedom and how do we protect that. Uh, but I think what's relevant in all these and, and also some of the trends that have been witnessed are this kind of offensive uh, against critical thinking. So my understanding in relation to how we promote academic freedom is precisely to revive that, that sense. 
which is uh, how, how do we create those spaces uh, uh, to foster critical thinking? And in relation to students and how they react, I would like to maybe bring a very different experience, which is the experience we are having with these uh, students advocacy seminar that we organize uh, as, uh, as scholars at risk. Um, not just the University of Padua, where I work, uh, but also in other universities. And this is an international program. So students learn uh, about academic freedom by working for, uh, for scholars who are in prison themselves. So on real cases, it's either advocacy seminars or legal clinic, but really dealing with situations. And I should say that based on the last three years that uh, we've had these, uh, uh, these kind of activities, that students are not just super uh, responsive to this, uh, but they are really engaged. Uh, and that's also shown how much, how relevant it is that we do involve students uh, in any kind of activity that we do uh, in the promotion of academic freedom. Maybe the second point I would like to address, I don't know if I understood the, the question correctly in terms of programs uh, uh, and what has been going on in Germany, of course. So interestingly, you're mentioning academic in solidarity. And, and I think some of the, so there is a call for uh, different uh, communities and different states uh, to adopt uh, national programs. Uh, these are uh, not very widely spread. Uh, we only have few instances, few experiences of this. Uh, of course, there may be huge challenges once uh, we start from small numbers of, uh, of uh, scholars that are uh, asking for uh, support. And then we have Afghanistan and then we have Ukraine. So just to give an, a sense of the, of the scope of what we're talking about, scholars at risk normally received uh, until 2021, August 2021, something like 300 applications per year. Year. And then between August and October 2021, they received uh, over 1,500. So this becomes, even for those networks and associations that are dealing with the situation, it's like overwhelming in terms of how to carry out the process, selection, and all the kind of investigation which is needed. But then, of course, the major issue is uh, how to find spaces uh, for real hospitality for these people. So even if programs were in place, uh, it would be very harsh. Nevertheless, what we have witnessed with the Afghan crisis is that where these mechanisms were in place, uh, like in France, like in Germany, like in the UK, the capacity to respond to the emergency was a lot higher than uh, what we witnessed in many of our, of our uh, countries where individual universities tried to do different things and there was a very fragmented uh, kind of response precisely because the mechanism was not in place. So it's highly relevant that nowadays uh, the European Union finally, for the first time, has established uh, a Marie Curie a uh, dedicated program for Ukraine. The call is coming out in September. This is fully dedicated to scholars from Ukraine. And there are a number of aspects uh, taking into consideration there. Uh, part of this is uh, the, tem the, the temporal dimension. So there's a huge concern about brain drain uh, whereby scholars may be taken out of the country. So there is a lot of attention to the fact that even these kind of programs, they should be created and established and, and carried out uh, in order to allow for, uh, uh, for scholars as well as students uh, to actually maintain the connection, keep the connection, work in the partnership, and then uh, eventually uh, be able to go back. Uh, I think maybe th there's a lot more to say, but I think uh, there are programs uh, needed and there are challenges that come to this. One of the challenges is uh, the very high level of exclusion that, uh, that is associated to the labor market in our universities. There is not much space. So working to allow uh, different scholars to maybe consider alternative careers uh, and how the research and the knowledge that we develop may be useful outside of academia. So carry out research, but in other contexts, that's relevant. The other thing which I think is uh, maybe interesting also as a response to brain drain is uh, different experiments that are being done uh, by making use of technologies. Uh, and uh, in the Ukraine uh, context, I understand there's a plan for developing a Ukrainian uh, global university through partnership and of course, wide use of technologies. So even that may be something that allow to not only connect, keep the connection, but create new partnership. And in that respect, I think many of our universities, so that's also about the scholars and the experts, uh, many of our universities and departments, uh, we do have people with experience uh, in carrying out these virtual exchange kind of activities. So a lot more could be done uh, in that respect, uh, also to respond to some of the challenges. Okay, thanks. So the last word from Nonda, please. 
I'll be quick because a lot of things has been done and I'd like to answer just two questions. The one about the tension between academic freedom and objective truth and the one about the difficulty to teach students in X uh, about history. And those are very good questions, uh, complicated questions, and I'm not sure I have all the answers. But maybe I would like to clarify what do we mean by research. I don't think um, that uh, research is uh, ultra relativism, as uh, the, the person said. I think it's more complicated. I think research is adopting a critical mind. It doesn't mean that you deconstruct everything and leave a field of ruins. It means that you put yourself into a cumulative perspective, that you see that when you tackle a problem, people have tried to tackle it before. It's a cumulative process. You walk on their shoulders to see further. That doesn't mean breaking down everything. So that would be the way to, to do it. And we just are very conscious researchers that we are not neutral. We are never neutral. We choose the subjects that we are interested in. We have our ideas and our opinion, but we try to keep a critical distance. We are not neutral, but we try to be objective. And last, we are not like journalists. We have many points in common with journalists or with police. We do inquiries, but we don't do them in exactly the same way. For researchers, the thing that's important is not just madly deconstruct, it's to be aware of the instruments of social science, which are concepts and theories, and they change through time. And none of them has uh, encompasses completely the truth. There's no such thing as an objective truth. It's a long run process and truth at one moment can be uh, uh, contested, controversial, because there have been other findings. So I would be, I would simplify a little less the process of academic freedom and a research process, which is based on it, and uh, the tension with objective truth. As far as students are concerned, I think it's, there are always ways, and they are much in line with what Claudia said, there are always ways to interest them. And that's uh, involving them, having them do the research themselves. I remember in a completely different topic, it was about how to teach anti-Semitism. Some of the students were not at all in secondary schools, not really feel concerned. And one of the teachers just decided to make them work on the camp of Drancy, which was the, uh, the camp from where were deported Jews. And just to study each of them, they took a family and they followed it all during the time they spent till the deportation. And the whole class was absolutely changed the mind about antisemitism and what had happened there. I think there are always ways to make people interested, but I don't have the solution nor the answer to all your very good questions. Thank you very much. So it's now time now to close as we are running out of time. Uh, but I would like to express my gratitude once again to all our speakers for sharing their views, experiences and expertise and making efforts to be with us either here or online. And uh, so it's just a confirmation that the um, uh, um, working group on academic freedom has to work quite a lot, that the new initiatives uh, should be uh, scheduled. Uh, just the, the last 20 seconds to say that uh, the, uh, once again, a reminder that this uh, recently established uh, working group is uh, composed of David Farrell, uh, Sabine Sauruger, Anna uh, Kubatova, Tanya Muro, and myself. And there is also an um, uh, email address that you will find on a page within the, the website, the CPR website. So uh, please uh, keep in touch with us for any comments, ideas, initiatives, suggestions, or whatever you would like to tell us. And we'll be very happy to, uh, to, to reflect more about this. Once again, thank you very much. Yeah.